Hello everyone. Hope you are all doing well and staying safe. Today we will discuss a few things about paraplegia. So paraplegia is the weakness or paralysis of both the lower limbs. The word comes from the Greek word paraplesin, that means to strike on one side. On that topic, the different types of paralysis may be paraplegia, then monoplegia, which means paralysis of one limb, hemiplegia, that means the paralysis of one half of the body, and quadriplegia, that is the paralysis of all the four limbs. As we all know, the motor pathway starts from the motor cortex in the precentral gyrus of brain. It continues as the pyramidal tract through the brain stem and at the level of middle oblongata it crosses to the other side and then descends as corticospinal tract in the spinal cord. The second order neurons start in the anterior horn cells and continue as mixed spinal nerve then to peripheral motor nerve which finally supplies the muscle at the neuromuscular junction. If there is a damage to the structures in the brain, we get corticopathy. Damage to the corticospinal tract as well as anterior horn cells inside the spinal cord causes myelopathy. Lesion of mixed spinal and peripheral nerves lead to neuropathy and any pathology of neuromuscular junction or muscle itself causes myopathy. According to the predominant tone of the muscles, paraplegia can be spastic or flaccid. Spastic paraplegia is a feature of upper motor neuron type damage, while the damage to the lower order neurons, that is anywhere from the anterior horn cells and below, will cause flaccid paralysis. There are three stages of spinal cord damage. The first stage, stage of spinal shock, appears immediately after injury characterized by flaccid paralysis of the limbs, loss of reflexes, and paralysis of urinary bladder and rectum. This stage may last up to three weeks. Next is the stage of reflex activity, which is also known as the stage of recovery. If there is complete transaction of the spinal cord, paraplegia inflection appears, while if there is incomplete damage, the person develops paraplegia in extension. Babinski reflex is the first reflex that appears here, in case of complete transaction of spinal cord, mass reflex is present. Lastly, the patient may deteriorate to the stage of reflex failure when muscles become extremely flaccid and undergo wasting. Mass reflex is abolished and the person may ultimately succumb to the general infection or toxemia. So a little while back I said that paraplegia can be spastic or flaccid. Spastic paraplegia can be again of two types, paraplegia in flexion and paraplegia in extension. Okay, here is a cross section of the spinal cord showing both the ascending and descending tracts. If we look carefully, we can identify the corticospinal tracts, that is the pyramidal tracts, as well as the extrapyramidal pathways like vestibular spinal and reticulospinal tracts. So what happens in paraplegia and extension is that only a part of the spinal cord gets affected, leading to damage of the corticospinal tracts. This is a relatively early change. In partial damage to the spinal cord, some of the descending fibers in the lateral column, especially the vestibular spinal and reticular spinal tracts may be spared. So some connections persist between brainstem and spinal cord. Fibers of vestibular spinal and reticular spinal tracts mainly reinforce the activity of extensor motor neurons. Hence, we have extensor spasm of lower limbs. Among the clinical features, there is obviously spastic contraction of the extensor group of muscles, leading to adducted and extended hip, extended knee, and plantis flexed feet. Typical Philipson's reflex or clasp knife spasticity can be elicited. Deep reflexes are brisk and sometimes even clonus is present. Plantar reflex is extensor. However, mass reflex is absent here.
Regarding paraplegia inflection, there is complete transaction of spinal cord. It is generally a late feature or associated with progressive lesions, which ultimately involves the whole section of the spinal cord. Here, both the pyramidal and extrapyramidal fibers are affected, so there is no reinforcement of the extensor group of muscles. Hence, lower limbs take attitude of flexion with hip and knee flexed and feet dorsiflexed. Patient adopts lateral decupedus and heel may touch the hip of the same side. Deep reflexes are diminished. Plantar response, though extensor, may be associated with flexor spasm. Mass reflex is seen in this kind of lesion. Regarding mass reflex, it is a pathological reflex where on stroking or scratching the skin of the lower abdominal wall or the lower limbs, there is reflex flexion of the lower limbs and lower abdominal muscles, pilo erection and penile erection, involuntary discharge of bladder, bowel and semen, and sweating. It is a reflex of spinal automatism associated with severe spinal cord damage like complete transaction of the spinal cord. Paraplegia due to cerebral or cortical lesions are rare. Acute onset paraplegia due to damage to the brain can be due to unpaired anterior cerebral artery thrombosis, thrombosis of superior sagittal sinus, penetrating lesions like bullet injury. Some cerebral conditions producing a more slower onset may involve parasagittal meningioma, and congenital disorders like little species. So let's discuss the clinical features in case of paraplegia due to cerebral lesions. It may help us to understand the topic more easily if we consider, for example, the thrombosis of unpaired anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery supplies part of the medial half of the frontal lobe and a strip of brain tissue superiorly in the midline. This area of distribution involves the sensory and motor homunculus that controls the lower legs. So if there is a lack of blood supply to these areas due to unpaired anterior cerebral artery lesion, we will get paraplegia in extension as well as cortical sensory loss in the lower limbs. Frontal lobe is important for cognitive and higher functions. So there will be abnormalities in those modalities too. There may be associated cranial nerve palsies as well as focal neurological disturbances leading to partial seizures like Jacksonian epilepsy. And features of increased intracranial tension like vomiting and headache. One important area supplied by the branches of anterior cerebral artery is the paracentral lobule that controls bladder and bowel movements. Hence in this case, the paracentral lobule gets affected leading to what we know as cortical bladder, characterized by loss of voluntary bladder control, urgency at low volume, and involuntary bladder evacuation, even at socially inappropriate situation. Damage to the spinal cord or myelopathy is a major cause of paraplegia. Myelopathy may be compressive or non-compressive. As the name suggests, compressive lesions cause injury by direct pressure effect but can also block the arterial blood supply leading to ischemic damage and may also impede venous blood flow producing venous congestion and subsequent injuries to the spinal cord. Compressive myelopathy may again be of acute onset or chronic onset. Causes of acute compressive myelopathy include bleeding in the exedural space that is epidural hematoma, epidural abscess, Hemorrhage within the spinal cord, that is hematomyelia, from arteriovenous malformations, angiomas, or endotoritis. Interventricular disc prolapse. Even collapse or fracture of vertebral body arising out of, for example, osteoporosis.
Coming to the causes of compressive myelopathy, they can be considered as intramedullary and extramedullary based on the location of the lesion. Intramedullary lesions are the ones that occur within the substance of spinal cord and they comprise of 5% of all compressive myelopathy. They include glioma, which is a type of tumor that starts in the neuroglial cells of the brain or the spine. Then there are ependymoma arising from ependymal cells. Ependyma is one of the different types of neuroglia in the central nervous system and it is involved in the production of cerebrospinal fluid. Usually in pediatric cases, the location of ependymoma is intracranial, while in adults it is spinal in location. Chordoma is a rare slow-growing neoplasm that, that is thought to arise from cellular remnants of the notochord. Astrocytes, also known collectively as astroglia, are characteristic star-shaped glial cells in the brain and spinal cord. They perform many functions including biochemical support of endothelial cells that form blood-brain barrier. Astrocytomas are most common glioma and can occur in most parts of the brain and occasionally in the spinal cord. Syringomyelia is a generic term referring to a disorder in which a cyst or cavity forms within the spinal cord. These cysts called a syrinx can expand and elongate over time, destroying the spinal cord. It may occur due to an abnormality of the brain called the Arnold Chiari malformation or Chiari malformation. Syringomyelia can also occur as a complication of trauma, meningitis, hemorrhage, a tumor, or arachnoiditis. Here, the cyst develops in a segment of spinal cord damaged by one of these conditions. Then, the syrinx starts to expand. Regarding the extramedullary causes of chronic compressive myelopathy, they can be again intradural extramedullary and extradural extramedullary. Intradural extramedullary lesions are located outside the spinal cord but within the dural sheath and comprise about 15% of all chronic compressive myelopathy. One such pathology is meningioma, also known as meningeal tumor, a typically slow growing tumor that arises from the meninges. A neurofibroma is a benign nerve sheet tumor in the peripheral nervous system. In 90% of all cases, they are found as standalone tumors, while the remainder are found in persons with neurofibromatosis type 1, an autosomal dominant genetically inherited disease. Neurofibromas arise from non myelinating type swan cells that exhibit biallelic inactivation of the NF1 gene that codes for the protein neurofibromin. Then there may be patchy arachnoiditis arising from diseases like tuberculosis, syphilis, sarcoidosis, and also spinal arteriovenous malformations. Finally, considering the extramedullary extradural causes that constitute majority of the cases, about 80% of chronic compressive myelopathy. Here the problem lies outside the dural covering of spinal cord but inside the vertebral column. One of the most common causes of such myelopathy is tuberculosis of spine that leads to POTS paraplegia. Then there may be myeloma or even metastatic deposits in the vertebra. Paraplegia can also be produced by prolapsed intervertebral disc. Diseases like thalassemia can lead to extramedullary hematopoiesis that causes bony compression of the cord. Finally, slow degeneration of the vertebral column that is spondylosis can be responsible for paraplegic features as well. So that would be all for today. Thank you for your patience, stay safe and keep well.